Um, we've been in this series called Winning the War in Your Mind. Uh, it's actually a book written by Craig Rochelle that we based this series on. And it's a four-part series based on the four sections of that book. If you haven't read that book, uh, I would recommend it to you. I read it during my sabbatical this past uh, spring, and it made a huge impact on my life. The first week, J.O. preached about ruts and trenches. Hard to forget. Hard to forget, right? If you're blank faced right now, you obviously did not see that message. Um, second week, last week, Craig uh, talked to us about rerouting and rewiring our brains. You know, he showed us the kind of plastic Richter set situation where he dropped the marbles and kind of showed us these, these different ways that we can actually train our minds with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, today, I want to talk to you uh, about a different uh, part of, of our minds and our emotions. And uh, this sermon is entitled The Path of Peace. There's two passages that I want to talk about today that, that I believe that the Lord wants to unfold before us, and that's Psalm 100. We're going to read the whole thing. Don't worry, it's very short. But if it was long, we'd still read the whole thing, maybe. Philippians 4 is the other passage we're going to look at. So we'll do that right now, but I want to invite you to be very old school and stand for the reading of the Word. What's cool about reading Scripture as a preacher that I always like is if the rest of what I say is lame and bogus, at least some beautiful, perfect truth was spoken. Now, hopefully the rest of what I say is not lame and bogus because I want to rightly divide the word of God and I want to show yeah. myself approved. Yep. But at least we're going to get a nugget of pure truth. Come on, Amen? That's right. So let's start with Psalm 100. It goes like this. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. That was the whole psalm. We're gonna look at Philippians now, which is a letter from our brother Paul. He actually wrote it from a prison cell. Isn't that neat? I don't know if it's neat. That might not be the best word for that. Risha hates it when I say the word neat. I guess it's not a cool word, but sometimes it feels appropriate for me. Nevertheless, he wrote it from a prison cell to the church at Philippi. And it's really interesting to think about the words he uses in light of being in a prison cell. Most of us would probably have a much more sour attitude than what he has right now. Let's go ahead and start in verse 4. Rejoice from the prison cell. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness or your gentleness or your true justice in the Greek be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. You can be seated. Will you pray with me? Got a couple of yeses, so we'll go ahead and go for that. Yes, yes, yes. It's okay to respond when I ask questions. It's cool. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this wonderful, lively bunch of people who are going to preach back at me today. And uh, Lord, we pray that your word would transform us today. We thank you that it is living and active, that it's not just some history book. And that despite what culture wants to say, that it is still the truth. It is our key of keys. And we stand on your word today, Lord. Let our hearts be good soil to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Cool. So go ahead. You can just go ahead and put the picture up right away. It's all good. Wow. Let's go, man. If you can't tell, the one on the right is me. The one on my left is dad with his big, beautiful blue eyes. And we are bow hunters. Really, my dad's a bow hunter, and I'm a bow hiker. Wow. Okay. Okay. So far, my bow hunting career has not been extremely fruitful. I have taken one. No, I've taken two deer. 
I'm still in search of that elusive elk. Some of you who have, who have harvested an elk with a bow, if you could just impart that to me sometime, I'd really appreciate that. Now, my dad, he's more, he's like, he's like the, a master of archery. He's, and he's, he's like that person who, if you've ever hunted with him, he'll be walking and he'll start sniffing the air. And he'll say, is that laundry detergent? You washed your clothes in laundry detergent? That's a snapshot of hunting with my dad. We have a lot of fun, but he's not joking around when it comes to harvesting elk. Now, one time we were hunting a few years ago. It might have been this trip. It might have been one of the years before or after. We were up the Coeur d'Alene River in a place we like to hunt, a place actually very familiar to my dad. And on this hunt, my dad was using a brand new GPS. And uh, he had used his previous one for probably 15 or more years. And uh, how many hunters out there do we have? Okay. How many of you guys use the GPS? Wow, you guys are all just men and women of the wild. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Good on you. Well, we use a GPS. We, we try to survive all of our hunts. Sorry if that was insensitive, but, you know, we do. That's why we have a GPS is to get back to the truck. So on this hunt, it's, I think, my, dad first, my dad's first time using the GPS. And uh, we get to this place, and all of a sudden, I can feel from my dad this kind of different vibe going on. And it seems like he's not so familiar with this place that he's also familiar with. So he pulls out his brand new GPS. And then I see a little bit of panic go over him. Because where the GPS is saying where the truck is, is very different from where his gut is telling him where the truck is. Okay. Uh-huh. Now, my dad is a man of the wilderness, and nine times out of ten, his gut would be the right thing in that situation. He knows this area like the back of his hand. That being said, I, as a young millennial, okay. try to humbly, uh-huh. gently sure. say, Dad, we should trust the GPS. So we trusted his gut. Okay. Right. Okay. My dad and I have a relationship in where he is the leader and I am the follower, and it's clear. My suggestion was not taken in that moment. So we go and we start following his gut. And then he realizes that we are not headed toward the truck. And so we give the GPS a chance. But as soon as we give the GPS a chance, mind you, this is an afternoon hunt, and the sun is going down, and it has begun to rain. So, although we're giving the GPS a chance, there's still this thing inside of my dad's heart that says, I want to be able to find out whether this GPS is correct before sundown. So what do we do? We run. Okay. In the rain, up and down hills, on wet logs and loose leaves, we run through the woods. Now, again, I want to just make it clear. Nine times out of ten, I would be wrong in this situation, and he would be right. I go in the woods, and I'm a fish out of water. He's not. But one thing as a young millennial that I have learned to do is trust my device. So we run over the hills and through the woods. And lo and behold, just before dark, a dark green F-150 sitting exactly where the GPS said it was. Now, what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is, it's just a suggestion. Trust your GPS and not your feelings. I'm going to take it a little bit further for those of you who didn't quite catch that. God has provided to us a global positioning system. And there are some very clear instructions inside of it. And I want to encourage you 
to trust your GPS and not your feelings. Come on. Come on, Seth. That's right. Now, within this GPS, it's really quite beautiful. Within this GPS, he has given us a path with several waypoints to a destination called peace. And it's laid out in the scriptures almost as clear as day if you'll give the scriptures a chance to impart truth into your life. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Now, I want to start, where is our starting point when we have not even stepped foot on the path of peace? When we are left to our own thoughts, our own emotions, our own proclivities and tendencies. It could be described as confusion, as wandering, depression, hopelessness. For all intents and purposes today, we're going to summarize those feelings, and we're going to call it, similarly to what I saw on my dad's face, when his gut was different from the GPS, we're going to call it panic. Okay? Now, Paul, thankfully, speaks directly to this state of mind in Philippians 4. What does he say? Do not be anxious about anything. In other words, don't panic. Now, for any of you like me who have actually battled panic and anxiety in your life, that phrase, when you are experiencing panic, is about as valuable. It's not valuable. (laughs) Just hear me. When you're in a state of panic and someone comes and just says, don't panic. Let you, I can't tell you, I can't say on the stage what I would like to say in response to that if that's all you're going to leave me with. Uh-oh. I shouldn't say it at all if I'm not going to say it on the stage, but hey, you know what? I'm human. <laughs> Thankfully, Paul doesn't just leave it at that, right? Yeah. He doesn't just say don't panic and then feel like he gave some good advice. <laughs> some of you all need to stop patting yourself on the back when you give advice like don't panic. I need to as well. But what does he do? Even before he mentions anxiety, he's already pointing toward the path. What does he say? The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. Before he even mentions anxiety, the starting place, the Lord is at hand. So we begin to see the picture of the path, okay? You're, you're pointing out to me that God is near. But what does he say directly after? Things become more clear when he says this. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Here's where we begin to see with some greater clarity this path. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Now, you've probably heard this scripture a thousand times, but do you know how those words are defined? The words that Paul is actually using in the original Greek language and what they mean. First of all, let's define prayer. In the Greek, this word is used to describe an exchange of wishes. Let's think about that for a minute. In an exchange of wishes, there is a sharing part and a receiving receiving part. Part of what Paul is saying in this is, but in everything, share your wishes to God. But make sure you listen to his desires as well. That's right. Man. Moving on to supplication. Supplication is really interesting because supplication is what a lot of us practice as the fullness of our prayer lives. But it certainly should not be the case. Supplication is the presentation of our needs or our lack. Some of us, that's the only prayer we ever do. It's like we only recognize that, that God is even real whenever we're in a bind. God, help me. God, save me. Please just get me out of this. (laughs) Now, there's a place for that because he is a very present help in time of need. But if that's the only kind of communication you ever have with him, let me just present this to you. There's a reason that panic is still present in your heart. Moving on to Thanksgiving, it's a little bit more straightforward. Thanksgiving can either be the literal giving of thanks, which we would think that that's what that means, but it can also be an inward state of gratitude. Here's the path so far. What is the result of this path? What does Paul say directly after this? He says this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your minds, actually says hearts first, 
Every word matters. Well, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace, but not just any peace. There is a peace of the world. It's a counterfeit. It's cheap. It's shallow. And it will leave you dry every single time. And it will leave you wanting every single time. And you'll fall back into the same old thought patterns every single time when you accept the counterfeit of peace that the world has to offer. The peace of God is beyond our comprehension. And it's so powerful that it does a very special thing. It can actually guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Now, what does that mean, in Christ Jesus? Thank you for asking. Let's continue reading to find out. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise. Think about these things. Here we see another element of the path. But is this just thinking happy thoughts? No. No. Paul is not going, don't panic, think happy thoughts. No. Thinking happy thoughts is a good thing to do. But what he's really saying here, this think here, is take into account. Now, why is that important? Because what Paul is saying is you must take these things, not just the problem, not just the overwhelming feeling, take these things into account. And by the way, what is more excellent or more pure or more commendable, or more worthy of praise than the person of God himself. See, when we think upon these things, when we take these things into account as part of the story and part of our reality, it sets us on the path of thanksgiving and praise. It's the same path leading to the same destination, but worded a little bit differently. Seth, why would you care about it being worded a little bit differently? Because we're talking about God's word where every single word matters right. and you don't get to throw one of them out That's right. and neither do I Preach it. makes you uncomfortable you don't get to cross it out <laughs> bumps up against some feelings you have you can go get lost in the woods all you want <laughs> but there's fruit of that and there's fruit of taking heed to the word of God yep. anyway where was I Paul says this, he words it a little bit differently, and he says, not just the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds, but the God of peace, a little bit different there, will be with you. Why does that matter? Because, again, we're seeing a waypoint on the path to peace. God does not just give us an ethereal, abstract idea of, I'm not as stressed as I was. He gives us himself. He gives us his presence. Speaking of God's presence, I want to take a different angle to this path for just a moment and look at Psalm 100 again. The final phrase of verse 2, come into his presence with singing. Did you know singing is spiritual? Oh, it is. One way or another. One way or another, it is a spiritual thing. We don't just do this because we like nice sounds. I mean, I love music as much as the next person, but we do this for a reason. We do this because we believe that we have a calling, and I'm speaking for the heart creative in this situation. I feel like I can speak for us. Because we have a calling to facilitate significant encounters between God and people through creative expression. I don't know why God chose to use singing. I don't know why he chose to use praise. I don't know why he chose to use instrumentation, but I'm just so glad that he did. (laughs) He goes on, and the psalmist goes on in verse four, it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. How cool is this? So we got the gates. Thanks, God. And we got the courts. God, you are good. Wow. Oh my. Come on. That's just as I'll do that again. Thanks, God. Oh, there's nothing. It's better than you. Oh, there's nothing. 
that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing, and nothing is better than you. All of a sudden, I just stepped into his presence. Interesting, the, the principles here. We enter into his presence with singing, with thanksgiving, and with praise. How familiar, Philippians 4. So let's put this together. Number one, God is at hand. I love that phrase because it communicates a very close closeness. He's at hand. He's near. He is not far off. That's the first point. Do not be anxious is actually the second point. The first point, for a reason, God is near. That is true. The second truth, God's will for your life is not for you to be anxious. And anyone who has ever told you that his will for your life is to be anxious was wrong. The most common command, or at least within the top three most common commands of all the Old Testament, what is it? Do not fear. That's not just consoling. Don't be afraid. That's a command. Do not fear. His will for us is not to have anxious thinking. But he doesn't just say do not fear. He says, here's how you do not fear. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, and praise. (coughs) Seth, I, I, I tried that. Okay. Prayer, in exchange of wishing, you extend your wishes, you receive wishes. Supplication, communicating your needs and lacking. Thanksgiving, actually saying thank you, God, for what he's already done and what he's doing now and what he's yet to do. And praise, you dwell on the characteristics and, the, and who God is. If you don't know how the Bible describes God, you may have trouble with praise. It's important to know what the word says about God so that you can agree with it. Where does this lead us? Into his presence. Now, you may, just, you may call me a little bit on this and be like, Seth, your first point was that God is near. But then you said we enter his presence with this prayer and supplication and thanksgiving and praise. How can both of those be true? What a, I mean, I just can't believe you even came up with that question. That's wonderful. This is a little bit tough. And there's some nuance to it. And I think it's a bit of a paradox. But we're going to wrestle with it today, okay? You guys going to join me in the wrestling? Okay, here we go. And there is a sense in which God is always with us. The Holy Spirit has indwelt us as believers. We called upon the name of Jesus. We put our trust in him. And the Holy Spirit marks us as sons and daughters. Okay? In that sense, we are never apart from God. Some of us would refer to this just as a helpful tool of reference as omnipresence. He's here. He's there. He's everywhere. Okay? Now... We move on to this place where God shows himself, reveals himself, is present in a special way in certain circumstances. How do you know that? Where two or more are gathered in his name, he is there in a special way. Ask me to explain it? I can't. It just is. Jesus said it. It's true. (laughs) That's right, okay? Number two, when we come to him with our prayer, our supplication, our thanksgiving, and our praise, he is here in a special way. Some of us, as a helpful tool, would call this God's principal presence. It is a principle that he is present in these particular situations. Fair? Now, this last one is a little bit more mystical, but very biblical. Which I'll just make a side point here. If you think you signed up for a naturalist point of view or worldview or faith, you're on the wrong bus. That's right. That's right. Uh huh. This is a supernatural reality that God has placed us in. However, you want to cut it. Now, we in the West, we have an issue with this. We struggle with the supernatural. We're like, let me see it. Let me hear it. Let me taste it. Let me touch it. Let me smell it. 
That's called empiricism. And it matters to an extent. We serve a supernatural God who has placed us in a supernatural reality. It makes me think of this scene from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. If you've already prejudged me for watching this movie, we can absolutely have coffee later and we can talk about whether it's legitimate for me to watch that movie or not. That's fine. <laughs> Captain Barbosa says this, and I'm not going to do a really good job of his voice, so forgive me. You, got this. <laughs> you best start believing in ghost stories. You're in one. Yeah. <laughs> now, wow. the point I'm making... <laughs> The point I'm making is in that situation, it's a little bit different. It's kind of weird, and there's these undead pirates and all that jazz. <laughs> but there's a principle to be learned for this Christian life that we walk. Christianity is not a 90s Christian bookstore with light blue carpet and a bunch of CDs. That, I'm, oh no, no, I can't. <laughs> now, I'm not hating... I'm not hating on Christian bookstores. They, they have a wonderful value, but there is a place for, you know, updating and all those kinds of things. <laughs> what I'm saying, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is this. God is so much bigger than cultural Christianity, and you best start believing in ghost stories because you're in one. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean it in the most beautiful, positive sense I could ever mean it. The Holy Ghost has come upon us, and we better get used to him doing what he wants because we're in his reality. That's a side point. That's just a side point. We got to move on. The reason why I say any of that is because it's a bit mystical, but God, sometimes he reveals himself and he shows up in a very unique way, in an undeniable and tangible way that you walk away and you go, I don't know quite what to say, but I've just been with the most high. And we can make an argument here and you could say, Seth, and I've done this too. I mean, there's, there's this place for like, what exactly just happened when that happens? Well, Seth, you just became more aware of his presence. Well, maybe. That's probably part of it. He opened my eyes and my ears and I was in, my, in the spirit and I was able to perceive him. But there's also a scriptural place for him to kind of do what he wants and manifest himself the way that he wants at any particular time. If he feels and if he feels something, it's the truth, that it's going to be helpful in that particular situation for seeing his mission and his purposes accomplished on this earth. So, in God's manifested presence, did we just become more aware or did he come here in a more special way? Um, yes? My point here is this. This is the greater point. I don't really come to argue about presence. I came to tell you that we enter into his presence. This is the thing. You know, we talk about principal presence, and the last one I described, we'll just, we'll just call it manifested presence, just to give it a term so that we can describe it. That one's a little bit more mysterious, and it doesn't seem fair, and there's really no formula for it. I'll just say that. But I will say this. Don't treat it as a formula, but do treat it as a principle. If you will practice the principal presence of God, if you will do what he says about when he likes to come, you will run into his manifested presence. Right. I promise you that. Right. You can test it. Now, don't try to treat it like a little, like a little trigger thing and wait for your goosebumps to come. Because that ain't it either. There's goosebumps that come from a lot of things in this world, and they ain't all God. Yep. That's right. Good point. And sometimes you may feel nothing emotionally. He's closer than your breath. Yep. Don't be led by your emotions. They're a wonderful travel companion and a terrible travel guide. But hear me, hear me. In his presence, we step into his presence when we reflect on who he is and what he has done. And part of what God, what, part of what Paul says that God is, is a God of peace. Now the scriptural evidence here is pretty clear, but it doesn't just stop with scripture. Did you guys know <laughs> that the truths of the Bible are beginning to unfold more and more in scientific findings. I don't know yeah, if you knew that or yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God that science catches up with God's word. Praise God. 
There's a lot of people that want to silence that, but it's true nevertheless. Andrew Newberg is a neuroscientist at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. He's a pioneer of a somewhat new field called neurotheology in which he observes people's brains on like scanners and things like that. I, I am not good with the science terminology or medical terminology. My wife is very good at it. She's a dietist, dietitianist, nutritionist, but I'm just, I'm, I'm over here. You, this doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> He studies brains during and in the presence of and surrounding spiritual practices, spiritual activity, okay? So this is what he's found. His studies have shown that prayer and praise are like a physical workout for the brain. Another neuroscientist, her name's Caroline Leaf, she has found that 15 minutes of of uninterrupted praise impacts the form of the brain so much that it will show up in a brain scan. There's more. There's more. Prayer and praise regulate and decrease the amygdala's fight or flight response. Now, the amygdala is really important if you're being attacked by a bear. It's not as valuable when you get a worrisome text message. It's not, it's not as valuable when, when your phone is blowing up with notifications and all of a sudden you get that, that pit in your stomach, that anxious pit. It isn't meant for you. That's your amygdala going, fight or fly, fight or fly, fight or fly. And you know what prayer and praise do? Amygdala, shut it down. Amygdala, chill. What else does it do? What does is, what is, what is prayer and praise do? Praise specifically has been observed to lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, and increase the volume of a part of our brain called the cingulate cortex, which impacts our ability to have empathy and compassion for people. Wow. Just feel me. Wow. God, you are worthy. You're rich in mercy. You're slow to anger. Your steadfast love endures forever. And all of the sudden, my brain has more of an ability to love. Hmm. God's word isn't catching up with science. Science is catching up with God's word. Now let's think about this for a minute, just just for ourselves. Not just what scripture says, yes, not just what science says, but let's think about the logic of this. Why would prayer and praise have such a positive effect on our minds and bodies? Let me present this to you. In the midst of feeling overwhelmed, what do these things do? We pray, just think about it logically. We pray, we exchange wishes. We acknowledge that God wants to hear about our desires and that he wants to communicate his desires to us. Okay, that's prayer. Supplication. We acknowledge that we have need, and God wants to hear about our needs, and he's able to fulfill them. Okay, thanksgiving. We thank God for what he's done, and therefore remind ourselves of all the goodness that he has shown us, all the ways that he's already come through in our lives. We praise, we, we recount his character, we recount who he is, what he's about, how great he is, and we recognize these things. He's close, he has the ability to help, and he wants to. And our minds, our wills, our emotions, and even our bodies cannot help but respond to those truths as we are reminded of them. We come to God in a state, this is like a memory tool, so we're gonna summarize a little bit, use a little bit of alliteration. We come to God in a state of panic. We bring him our prayer and our praise, also including supplication and thanksgiving, but both of them were peace, and so it's easy to remember. We experience his presence, and it is there that we find peace. This is the path. You guys stand, please. Now here's the secret, because for some of you in the room, you might be going, whoa, 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 Seth, that is, a, that is a strange order in the path. And I agree with you. But this is a starting place. The starting place might be that we're in so much need of peace that that is truly what we're seeking and that we can't really think about these other things because we're so anxious, we're so depressed, we're so um, f- full of panic and, and, and worry. And that's an okay place to start. But here's the beautiful thing. As you mature, as we mature into the fullness of the stature of Christ, did you know 
that the path actually has a different ending place. What happens is that his presence no longer becomes a waypoint. It becomes the destination because we recognize in his presence is not just peace, but it's all that we need. We learn to seek the person of God and find that he is the source of all that is good. So if you need peace today, by all means, seek out peace. But the spoiler alert is that if you seek his presence, you'll find so much more.